just the two of us by Chris Harvey secret meetings in the dead of night it felt quite exciting it was something that Janet Nichols had never done before and it made her feel good and in more ways than one she quickened her pace coaxed on by the thought of that which awaited her at the end of her journey which wasn't long away now would the other already be waiting wondering where she was and whether she was going to make it the night seemed particularly quiet she had seen no one and had heard nothing apart from the sound of a car starting up somewhere behind but that had been shortly after she had left the house janet pushed her hands deeper into her pockets seeking some warmth from their depths the chill november air was rapidly seeping through her thin leather gloves and she knew it would only be a short while before it gnawed all the way to the bone making the night unbearable just before setting out she drank a mug of steaming coffee which although tasting a little bitter had warmed her a little inside it was just the outer shell that was the problem but then she didn't intend to stay out in the cold for much longer warmth and comfort and pleasure ultimate pleasure not pain awaited her arrival just around the corner now her heels beat out a tattoo as she quickened her pace even more her eagerness pushing her forwards she paused for a moment beneath the warm glow of a street light lifting her wrist and squinting down at her watch 123 early 7 minutes early but then she wasn't there yet i'll be there yeah, and you make sure you're there on time, not a minute late. I don't fancy hanging around for long on my own. Same here. So why are we meeting there of all places? Because it's exciting, that's why. You'd be adventurous for once. And so she was. But then she was in love and would probably have done anything. This was certainly different, though. It'll be a fantasy come true, meeting in the middle of the night, just the two of us, whilst the rest of the world sleeps totally oblivious. Her heels were beating out a rhythm again as she began the last leg of her journey. The difficult part had been getting out of the house without Ray knowing, but that obstacle had been flung effortly aside by adding a couple of sleeping pills to his bedtime drink. Out like a light, dead to the world. And now she knew she could stay out all night, enjoy the nocturnal pleasures in a way she never had before, and still be back in bed by the time Ray dragged himself from slumber in the morning, none the wiser. Rise and shine, darling. Sleep well, did we? Like a log. And you? Pleasant dreams? Oh, yes. Don't you know your wife is having clandestine meetings with another? That was a fear. The thought that someone might be watching might tell Ray what she got up to in the dead of night. But then the rational part of her mind told her not to be so stupid. No one knew. No one was watching. No one cared. No one. Except for... As she had been assured, the park gates weren't locked, and as she closed in on them, the blood began to pound inside her head as the excitement took hold. It made her feel nervous, too, but in a nice way. The same way she had felt when she had first fallen in love with Ray. But Ray had long since ceased to excite her like this. She didn't love him anymore. Couldn't possibly not after the way he had treated her. The old Ray had long since died, and had instead been replaced by an ogre. An ugly monster whose temper and violent outbursts had driven her to find love elsewhere. And that she had found which was, after all, why she was here. As she moved through the park gate, she paused again. She turned and looked around. The bus stop across the road looked eerie at night, lit as it was by the amber street lights. She was used to seeing it in the bright light of day, busy with queues of people, herself one of them, as she waited for the 8.30 bus to take her into work three mornings a week. 
and it was there that she had met the one she now loved. Her pulse skipped as the bench came into sight. In the full moonlight she could clearly see the outline of the bench and of someone sitting on it, waiting. That was a relief. The idea of waiting alone hadn't appealed to her. Her excitement mounting, she quickened her pace again, expecting the other to turn, hearing her approaching, then to stand and rush to meet her with welcoming arms. But the figure remained still. The bench was less than twenty feet away now, and the sound of her heels seemed to echo all around the park. But still the figure didn't move. Already she was anticipating the welcome, could feel the soft lips meeting her own. Her eager reply as she did the same, closing her mouth over the others, kissing the lips hungrily, deeply, probing with her tongue, seeking the sweet warmth beyond. Already she was experiencing the tingle of desire that electrified her entire being. She felt wanted again, wanted so badly. This was most definitely love. And then for a moment she did feel weak. Her legs seemed to give at the knees and a sensation of drowsiness swept over her. She paused, gave her head a quick shake in an attempt to clear the sensation. It seemed to work and she continued on, still surprised that the figure hadn't risen to greet her. Less than ten feet away now and still no movement, even stranger the figure seemed to be sitting at an awkward angle, leaning to the left, head hanging limply. Surely she can't have dozed off, not out here and in this freezing temperature. Not possible. Maybe not possible to sleep, but... Janet reached the bench. As she moved around the front of it and looked down at the occupant, something, at first she wasn't sure what, caused an ice-cold feather to race up her spine, making her flesh tighten and break out in goosebumps. At the same time, her pulse began to pound inside her head, throbbing inside her ears. It was Alison. Of that there was no doubt. But there was something out of place, something different that, especially in the dim blue cast of the full moon, wasn't immediately obvious. Janet edged closer and suddenly realised that she was shaking, and not because of the cold. Closer, the other side of Alison's face came into sight. Black treacle running down Alison's face. At least that's what it looked like at first. And then the next instant, she realised that it wasn't treacle at all. It only looked black because of the light. And although Alison was staring eyes wide, Janet suddenly knew that sight had long since deserted those once piercing and beautiful emerald orbs. Janet's heart was hammering away inside her chest now, like a fist trying to punch its way out through her ribcage. And then the same fuzzy sensation dulled her senses once more, but this time she couldn't shake it off. Hello, darling, what brings you here? The voice came from behind the bench, from within the shadows. It was a man's voice, immediately familiar and laced with sarcasm. She whirled around, knowing who she would see, but wanting so desperately not to believe it. A part of her wanted to scream, wanted to cry out for help from someone, anyone, but she knew she couldn't, physically couldn't, for something was lodged firmly inside her throat, a lump that was swelling in size by the second. Her husband's face leered down at her, his white teeth glinting it seemed in the full moonlight. Beads of sweat coated his face, but there was something else, dark specks of coloured moisture, though in the cool light Janet wasn't sure what colour. There were splashes of it in the material of his shirt as well. And then in a flash she realised that they were the same colour as the thick liquid which clogged Alison's hair and trickled down her face. A by-product of Ray's terrible work. The moment of drowsiness that had first hit her seconds early in our return, only more vehemently this time, and she almost collapsed. There was something very wrong. She felt suddenly strange and light-headed, a feeling not dissimilar to the effects of drunkenness. Shock? 
But then, as her eyes grew heavy, she realised that she felt tired, oh so tired, and shock wouldn't have that effect. Surely it would make her panic, pump adrenaline into her system, make her more alert. That's because it isn't shock. You dirty bitch, Ray spat, his face suddenly deadly serious. You thought you could carry on your perverse antics without me finding out, did you? And then he was smiling again, his lips curling back into a crazed leer. As he stepped towards her, Janet could feel her world beginning to spin. Ray's outline, bearing down on her, began to shoot off to the side and she found it more and more difficult to drag him back into her field of vision. And then he span through 180 degrees and inverted and was standing on his head. She tried to pull his feet back down to her earth, but only succeeded in making him walk the walls. And still he advanced on her. And just before blackness swallowed her up, sparing her the terrible pain that was about to come, it all fitted into place. Ray had found out. Somehow, God knows how, he had found out and had spiked her drink with something. She felt she wanted to smile. Maybe she did. She couldn't tell. And whatever it was, there was enough to drop a horse. As if Ray was reading her very thoughts, she saw him nod. He was almost on top of her now, his crazed, blood-spattered features shifting in and out of focus, but she could see that he was lifting the hammer slowly, as if for effect. Even through her blurred vision she could see the blood on the metal head, could see that it had trickled down the wooden handle and was already beginning to coagulate around Ray's fingers, as if threatening to stick them to the handle like glue. She had seen him mad. Lord, that was after all why she had turned to someone else in the first place, but she had never seen him like this. Ray swung the hammer up quickly and suddenly. She felt his other hand slam into her throat and grab hold of her collar, twisting it hard. She felt his knuckles pressing into her neck, hurting her, making it hard to breathe. Then her legs gave out from under her, and the pressure around her neck increased as she realised that Ray was supporting her entire weight with one arm. She could smell the coppery stench of Alison's blood on his hand, warm and heady. Secrets out, he hissed through clenched teeth and threw the hammer back. Thankfully, it was then that the dark veil fell, smothering her in its deadly embrace. And the one thought she had, the single thought which clung to her semi-conscious mind, was the thought that she would soon be with her lover her not-so-secret lover, forever. And then Janet Nichols' world ended with an earth-shattering explosion as the hammer smashed into her skull.